February science education. Thank you, Wendy. <laughs> I forgot. Um, uh, welcome everybody to the science education department February seminar series. And it's our pleasure to welcome Dr. Corey Moreau, who is at Cornell University. Um, and she is the Cornell University College of Agriculture and Life Science Senior Associate Dean of Diversity and Inclusion and the Martha and John Moser Endowed Professor of Arthropod Biosystematics and Biodiversity in the Departments of Entomology and Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Cornell. She is also the director and head curator of the Cornell University Insect Collection with over 7 million specimens. Um, Corey earned her PhD here at Harvard in evolutionary biology um, and worked very closely with E.O. Wilson. She's also a Miller Fellow at the University of California, Berkeley. She was elected to many positions, including a Fellow of the Royal Entomological Society, a Fellow of the Entomological Society of America, Fellow of the AAAS, a Kavli Fellow of the National Academy of Sciences USA, a National Geographic Explorer, and also highlighted as a woman of impact by the National Geographic Society in 2018. In addition, she has one genus and three species named after her. How cool is that? <laughs> Dr. Moreau's research on the evolution and diversification of ants and their symbiotic bacteria couples field-based research with molecular and genomic tools to address the origin of species and how co-evolved systems benefit both partners. Also, she pursues questions in the role of biogeography, trait evolution, and symbiosis in shaping macroevolutionary processes to better understand broad scale evolutionary patterns of life. She has published over a hundred scientific papers. And in addition to her passion for scientific research, Dr. Moreau is also engaged with efforts to promote science communication and increase, increase diversity in the sciences. So without further ado, we'd like to welcome Dr. Corey Moreau and we're pleased that you're here. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, <clears throat> I will share that uh, despite the fact that I've been very committed to science communication and to um, outreach, I'm actually going to not talk about that today because as Cindy sort of hinted at, one of my other passions is about making science more equitable and inclusive. So I'll spend part of the talk um, talking about my research, and then I'll spend the second half talking about what does the data tell us about um, who's being included and who's being excluded from um, STEM fields. So I wanna start with a land acknowledgement and a little bit of the history of the dispossession um, of Cornell University, which is located on the traditional homelands of the Guayacono, which is the Cayuga Nation. The Guayacono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Guayacono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Guayacono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. <clears throat> this land acknowledgement was reviewed and approved by the traditional Guayacono leadership. And for you, those of you at Harvard, the Massachusetts people have been a part of your land for millennia. It's important to recognize the current and ongoing negative impacts of colonialism on all indigenous people. And if you'd like to learn more, I encourage you to visit native-land.ca. So <clears throat> what really gets me excited research-wise is to think about what processes generate the biodiversity we see around us. Um, I tend to think about these from both the lens of the abiotic and the biotic interactions. From the abiotic perspective, things like temperature, precipitation, humidity, soil quality. But from the biotic side, really, I think a lot about those species interactions. And that can be from things like um, predators and prey all the way through these sort of more mutualistic interactions. And ultimately, I try to understand how symbiosis between these organisms is um, impacting the hosts, both at the sort of current level of the ecology, but also how that shaped their long-term evolutionary um, patterns. So as an evolutionary biologist, I tend to see the world through the lens of a phylogeny. Um, and what's really powerful about a phylogeny is that not only does it tell us about which species are more closely related to whom, right? So maybe we want to know who's the closest relative of an orangutan. But once we have a phylogeny, it's where it gets really interesting to me. So once you have the sort of, you know, network or evolutionary relationships of these partners, we can begin to ask questions about the evolution of traits. We might ask questions about how many times a particular physical features evolve? In the case of ants, maybe something like spines. 
We might want to ask the question about how many times has a certain behavior evolved or use of an ecological niche. <clears throat> we also can ask the question about why did things speciate? So why did something that was one population diverge and become more than one species? Can we link that with something we know about where they live in the environment? Did a mountain range arise and sort of separate those two populations? Or do we see that a river changed course? Now, almost all the work I do is molecular based. And so whether it's a, you know, the sort of multiple genes or whole genomes, we might want to ask questions about rates of molecular evolution. Why is it across the tree of life? Some parts of the tree of life have really fast rates of molecular evolution, while others have really slow rates of molecular evolution. And then if we have some kind of external information like the fossil record or major geologic events, we can actually put a time frame on that. We can ask, when did these traits evolve? You know, when did that speciation event happen? And how much rate change are we seeing in that particular time frame? <clears throat> ants engage in symbioses with many organisms and in fact across the tree of life. So we know that ants engage in symbiotic interactions with other animals. And so in this case, you can see on the left, there's an ant tending a scale insect that's sucking um, nutrients from the plant. The ant will um, defend the scale aphid and in return that aphid provides it honeydew. And that's the droplet you can see in the ant's mouth that it's actually um, gotten from that scale insect. We know that they engage in a lot of symbiotic interactions with plants from very diffuse and facultative all the way through obligatory relationships and ant-plant um, interactions. They engage in both positive and negative interactions with lots of groups of organisms. In this picture, you see um, Orpheocordyceps or the zombie fungus that's parasitized this ant and manipulated its behavior. But of course, we can think about the things like the leafcutter ants, right, where they're actually growing their fungal farms. And more and more, we're beginning to understand that the bacterial and you know, smaller microbial communities are having huge impacts on the evolution of the hosts. So I'll walk you through a couple of um, questions related to the evolution of ants that we've been working on in my lab. And first, we wanted to understand if ant-plant interactions have evolved through this sort of increasing interdependence through time. And so if you look at the sort of diversity of plants on the planet, up until recently, it was a very diverse community, and now really we're seeing that it's just dominated by the angiosperms or the flowering plants. Now, as those flowering plant forests expanded and became really diverse, many other organisms also began to diversify. So things like beetles and other insects that feed on plant went through births and diversification, pollinators, of course. But it's not just the things that are feeding and benefiting from plants directly that went through shifts in diversification. So things like epiphytes and ferns that benefited from the low light of the canopy provided under in the understory also went through bursts and diversification. And it might not be surprising to know that ants are another group that really benefited from the expansion of the flowering plant forests. So as those forests you know, sort of spread across the globe, the ants were taking advantage of the fact that there were all these new niches available. And part of that is that we see that there's lots more plant-derived food resources that are available to ants. So ants feed on plants directly, um, not by feeding on leaves necessarily, <clears throat> but through things like these extrafloral nectaries and the food bodies, as well as some plants um, put these uh, liosomes on their seeds to uh, encourage ants to, dis to distribute their seeds. And a lot of the feeding on these plants is actually indirect, and it's through tending those sap-sucking insects, like the scale insect I showed you before, or aphids. And so we wanted to understand how did these associations between these plants evolve? What we see is that in some cases, um, ants are just taking advantage of things like you know, plant wounds, but we also know that plants are producing structures specifically to attract ants. So we wanted to understand when did these traits evolve between the ants and the plants? And could we see some sort of evolutionary sequence by which ants and plants became reliant on one another? So the first thing we did is we took advantage of a very large um, plant phylogeny um, and we added in some additional data, including some ferns, um, since we know that some ferns have nectaries. Uh, and this represented almost 11,000 plant genera. And then once we had this sort of family tree for the plants, we asked the question, can we reconstruct the ancestral states for the traits that we think ants might be interested in? So those include things like those extra floral nectaries, those little sugar water fountains, Things like eliosomes, um, which are the seed coating that plants produce for ants to distribute their seeds, and these very specialized structures called domatia, 
which are specifically to host these defensive arthropods so that they're on the call to defend the plant immediately. Um, and then this is some work that was actually spearheaded by a former uh, postdoc in my lab, Matt Nelson. Um, and then we also inferred a very large phylogeny, uh, almost uh, over 1,700 species of ants, and again, used those statistical methods to do ancestral state reconstruction on things related to diet and foraging, specifically related, related to their interactions in plants. And so what we found is that um, we began to see how these traits are evolving in concert. Before I walk you through that, I want to remind you that for ants, the ground planner, the earliest ants, um, were predatory, right? So they were feeding on other arthropods, they were nesting in the ground, and they were foraging on the ground. And so what we see is the first trait that evolves is we see that ants begin to forage arborally. They start to take to the trees to look for prey items. Next, we see that they begin to include plants in their diet, and this in the earliest form, this is probably things like tending plant wounds. Um, next, we see the plants begin to respond. So now the plants are evolving things like extra floral nectaries, right? So they're taking advantage of this standing army of ants running all over the plants and using them as a, a source of defense. Now we see ants begin to nest arborally in the trees. So they're not just running up there, they're actually staying up there. And now we see the plants respond again. We see the evolution of eliosomes. So now they're taking advantage of these ants running all over the forest floor to disperse their seeds. And lastly, we see that most specialized structure, the domatia, evolve in plants specifically to house ants um, and attract them into the plants. So what we see is that ants utilize plants long before plants had evolved these specialized structures, and that we see this incremental sequence of evolution that led to this reliance on plants and plants on ants. And so we see that ants go from this ground nesting and foraging and predatory lifestyle to slowly being able to integrate plants more into their diet and into where they're nesting. And we see along that timeline that the plants are responding to having these potential partners um, in time evolve these specialized structures. Now, although we hadn't set out to specifically test this, one thing that we were able to show is that we never see ants transition from predatory directly to herbivorous. Now this had been hypothesized that we'd need this transition through this sort of like generalized diet, but it had never been formally tested. And interestingly, once we see ants become fully um, herbivorous or feeding explicit, exclusively on plants, we never see a shift to being predatory and we rarely see shifts back to omnivory, suggesting that once you get locked into this diet with plants, it's really um, difficult to sort of evolve back. And that leads right into the work that I've been doing looking at the role of bacteria and potentially facilitating the evolution of herbivory across the ants. <clears throat> so ants, I think, are a great system to study gut microbes for a few reasons, one of which, because they have evolved herbivory multiple times independently, we can ask the question, do they rely on the same microbes? Do they rely on microbes at all to facilitate their diet? In addition, because they're social organisms, we can actually split colonies and do things like manipulate their diets to see how they respond in real time to changes in the nutrients available. Because they're socially interacting organisms, we can ask questions about how individuals, uh, how those microbes are in, transmitted among individuals within a colony. And then we can even ask that question through time, like are there lineages of bacteria that seem to persist across evolutionary time within their hosts? And are they co-evolving with their hosts, right? And so this is the sort of the framework of why would we expect some microbes to co-evolve with hosts while not others? And then lastly, because microbes are everywhere and ants are almost everywhere, um, we can ask the question, are they just acquiring from the local environment or is there some sort of stable long-term association occurring? So the first thing, well, I sort of joked that when my long-term collaborator, Jack, Jacob Russell, um, and I started working on this, actually while we were at, uh, he was a postdoc and I was a grad student at Harvard, um, working with Nomi Pierce, we just wanted to know what was there. Uh, and so I sort of joked that we were like these early rainforest explorers just running through the Amazon, grabbing every single thing that we saw. Um, and, you know, maybe not surprisingly, in our first study, we sampled almost 400 individual ants from 150 ant genera, and we found a lot of bacteria. Um, you know, and that's really interesting in the sense of just describing the diversity that's there, but what really jumped out to us was this group of bacteria in really high abundance within our ant hosts. And this group of bacteria, the order Rhizobiales, um, includes bacteria that you might be familiar with. These are the rhizobia, and these are bacteria that are associated with the root nodules of leguminous plants, so things like beans, 
Um, and we know in this situation that the bacteria benefit from the plant, they get carbon um, from the plant, and in return, they fix atmospheric nitrogen and provide it to the plant hosts. So this was a puzzle. Why are we finding a group of bacteria that are related, not super closely related, but related um, within the guts of ants? Could they also be providing some form of nutrition to the host? This is a, a really interesting thing um, the, to understand sort of the trophic scale or sort of the food web of ants. So what you're looking at across the um, x-axis is the sort of trophic scale. So you're looking at the ratio or the accumulation of heavy nitrogen as it moves up the food chain. And this allows us to look at things that are very herbivorous all the way through things on this scale here. These are the army ants that are highly predatory. Now, what we've done is we've mapped along the y-axis the probability or the frequency by which we see this association with that group of bacteria. And what you'll notice is that only when ants feed low on the trophic scale do we see an association with this group of bacteria. But if you have a keen eye, you probably notice there's some ants that feed very low on the trophic scale and have no association with this group of bacteria. And that's really interesting because these are the carpenter ants and their relatives. And it's one of the few groups that we knew much about their bacterial communities associated with their guts. And in this case, they have a group of bacteria called Blockmania that has already been demonstrated to enrich the diets of the hosts. So it appears that if you're gonna feed low on the trophic scale, you need an association with some kind of bacterium. So what you're looking at here is the phylogeny of the bacteria, but color coded and labeled by the host or environment from which it was taken. And all of those tips that are in red are from ant hosts. And what you see is that almost all of the ant specific clay lineages are grouped together. And also, if you look at the names of the tips, those are the names of the ant host they came from. And the, ant, the bacteria from within the host are more closely related um, based on their host's evolutionary history, suggesting we might have some amount of co-diversification happening. But if we look at it from the ant point of view, we see that um, ants have acquired this relationship with this group of bacteria five times independently. So it's not just that it got into the ant lineage and sort of followed them through time. What we see is that it's independently been acquired in lineages that are feeding very low on that trophic scale. Now, <clears throat> if these bacteria are in fact enriching the host's diet, we'd expect to see some amount of tissue specificity across the digestive tract. So just to orient you within an ant gut, um, what we see is we have the crop and that's the social stomach, right? So we know that no digestion begins there. That's just a storage chamber so that they can carry liquid food resources and regurgitate it to other members of the lab. It's exactly the same as the crop within a bird, which is just the storage um, vesicle so that they can regurgitate to their offspring. Now, next we have the midgut. So as those nutrients pass from the crop into the midgut, um, that's where we know digestion begins. And then within the hindgut, we actually can break that out further to the ileum or essentially the large intestines and then the rectum where excretion occurs. So what we wanted to understand is sort of where are these bacteria distributed across this and do we see any tissue specificity? And this is some work that was done by a very recent um, PhD student in my lab, Peter Flynn, who's actually now a, a postdoc at Harvard. Um, and so hopefully I'll get a chance to meet him. But this is a really uh, a st an interesting study that he did where we dissected out each of the individual compartments and then looked at the diversity of bacteria within it. And what you see is the crop, so that's the social stomach, and each one of these bars is an individual ant sample. This is across many individuals, uh, um, uh, ants from different colonies and different species. And what you see is that across the crop, crop there's lots of diversity. I mean, there's nothing that's very stable. And in fact, most samples are dominated by a single bacterium, suggesting that it's probably just whatever contamination came in from the environment. Now, once we move into the midgut, where we know the digestion begins, we see that this bacterial community is incredibly stable and dominated almost exclusively by one lineage called Opetutales. Once we move into the ileum and the rectum, we see the remaining sort of core community members, which we already have known are there. Um, and they're pretty stable and consistent across the host, despite the fact that these ants are distributed from southern Brazil all the way through the southern United States suggesting that there's something that's filtering these bacteria and maintaining them through time. And it's not just the diversity that's interesting. If we look at the abundance, so the amount of bacteria in each of these um, digestive compartments, and if we look within the crop, you can see that even though we see that there are bacteria there, there's almost no bacteria there. Really, again, reflecting the fact that it's probably just some contamination from the environment. 
we see really high amounts of bacteria in the mid gut, suggesting that they may in fact provide some amount of uh, input to the hosts. And we see them maintain within the ileum and then of course drop off again in the rectum as they're being excreted. Um, and this is really interesting because what we see is in the mid gut, we have a single bacterium sort of isolated alone and dominating that particular compartment. And then within the ileum, we see a community of bacteria which are interacting with each other. And so this is some work done by a former PhD student of mine, Anais Chanson. And what we really wanted to understand is, do bacteria within these digestive compartments maintain the hardware for bacterial warfare? So what we did is we looked at the presence of these genes called biosynthetic gene clusters. And interestingly, the bacterium that lives in the mid gut has lost all of the hardware for this warfare because they're not competing with anyone. And interestingly, we only find that the bacteria associated with the ileum maintain these biosynthetic gene clusters, suggesting that they're not only sort of co collaborating sometimes, but they're also in competition for resources from the host. So we do have some direct evidence that they are in fact um, providing nutrition to the host. And the first comes in the form of both genome sequencing, but also metagenomic sequencing. And when we've been able to sequence the community members, and we've done this now across 18 different host species of turtle ants, we've been able to demonstrate that they have all of the hardware to synthesize essential and many unessential amino acids. So now we know that they have the capacity to enrich the host's diet, but the question is, do they actually provide that to the host or are these sort of common goods they're using to cooperate with other bacteria? So we did a series of experiments where we went in and took colonies of these turtle ants and knocked out their bacterial communities using antibiotics. We then went in and measured the amount of essential amino acids, not in the gut, because again, these bacteria could be synthesizing these things to share with each other. We actually measured the amount of those um, essential amino acids in the hemolymph or blood of the ant, meaning it would have had to cross the gut barrier and become incorporated into the host. Now, when we use bacteria to knock out the, if we use antibiotics to knock out the bacterial communities, or we don't enrich their diets, so we wouldn't see a shift in the amount of those amino acids, we see that those samples look almost identical. But when we leave the bacterial communities intact, oh, sorry, and enrich their diet, we see a huge increase in the amount of these essential amino acids found within the hemolymph of the host, demonstrating that bacteria is synthesizing these and then providing them to the host. So in the case of the turtle ants, what we see is their gut bacteria are in fact providing amino acids to their host via nitrogen recycling. So what I wanted to understand better is, so what if, if the bacteria are synthesizing all these essential amino acids, what is the host using them for? And so we wanted to understand whether that could be involved in the formation of the cuticle. And so just to remind you that insects cuticle is essentially it's armor, it's wearing it on the outside to protect it from the environment, from desiccation, um, from predators. Um, and across the ants, there's a lot of variation in how that armor um, is formed. Now I'll share with you the reason I got interested in trying to understand whether gut bacteria were contributing to the formation of the cuticle is I've sat under a microscope carefully dissecting thousands of individual ants. And although I hadn't set out to test this explicitly, the thing I had started to notice that the ants that were the toughest to break through were either predatory or were herbivorous and had gut associated bacteria. So this made me think that maybe well, nitrogen, you know, can be limited in the environment. And if you have the ability to invest it in your cuticle, you might want to do that. So just to remind you that the um, exoskeleton or the cuticle is essentially um, formed of chitin, which is a biopolymer, and then can have embedded proteins within it. And so the formation of the cuticle sort of happens through this thing called the tanning process. So the precursors to this are phenylalanine and tyrosine. And then once you have that, you can go down one of two pathways. One is the melanization pathway. So that's sort of the pigmentation component and is also involved in immunity or the sclerotization pathway. And that's really where um, we see the, the formation of the toughness or rigidity of the cuticle. So again, just to remind you, the insect cuticle is made of chitin. But in order for chitin to connect with that protein that I told you is often embedded, it requires a linker. And for the protein to attach to the linker, it requires the imidazole arm of histidine. 
There can be other embedded particles like melanin and metals. And in fact, we have a project where we've been looking at the presence of metals across the cuticle. Um, I won't present that today. It's still a work in progress, but um, keep your eye out for it. And of course, things like melanin, right, can be embedded within the cuticle as well. So this is some work that was done in the um, uh, uh, done about a decade ago. Uh, where they went in and looked at the sort of tanning process across the mandible of a, a grasshopper. And so this image on the right is a composite image of one of those mandibles pulled off all the way through being untanned through being fully tanned. And what they were able to demonstrate is that within this tissue, the amount of oxygen stays stable, but the amount of nitrogen increases, displacing carbon. And again, within those tissues, what we see is that the amount of chitin stays about the same, the amount of that sclerotized tissue increases and the amount of protein increases significantly, displacing water. And that's really what leads to the toughness, hardness, or strength that we see within the cuticle. So since we know we have this diverse bacterial community within the guts of turtle ants, and we know that they can synthesize essential amino acids, including those precursors, phenylalanine and tyrosine, are they contributing to the formation of the cuticle? So what we did is we took um, colonies of these turtle ants again, split them again, gave half antibiotics and half not. And we had to mark all the individuals that were alive in the colony and the adults when we started the experiment because we needed the um, diet labeled with urea and as well as the antibiotics to work its way through the uh, in larva all the way through pupation to the emergence of the new adults because the adults present already have formed their cuticle, right? So the manipulation, we wouldn't be reflected in those individuals. So we had to run the experiment for several months so that we could ensure that it was actually um, the signature of our experimental manipulation. We then used a series of analytical chemistry techniques to look at the presence, the impact of having antibiotics or bacterial communities intact. And then we use scanning electron microscopy to look at the cuticle um, itself. And so what we saw is that when we use antibiotics, we have a significant decrease in the amount of those precursors, tyrosine and phenylalanine. In some ways, this was a check because we've actually done this experiment before and we'd seen the same results. So we knew we were manipulating the system in the same way. Now, what we did is we used solid state NMR, which just allows you, it's an analytical a technique that allows you to trace a single isotope in a system. Um, and what we see is that when we leave the bacterial communities intact, right, so that's in red, we see a huge enrichment in the amount of nitrogen within the cuticle. And interestingly, if we look at which components of the cuticle do we see enrichment, we see an enrichment in the chitin, in that um, guad in the metazole arm of guadenine and of arginine, and we also see it in the crosslinkers. We and I'm sorry, in guadenine, of arginine, and in the metazole arm of histidine. So really, in all of the components of that cuticle, we're seeing the bacterial contribution to the formation of each of these. Now, interestingly, when we look at cuticle thickness, we see that the cuticle thickness decreases significantly, which is what's been seen in some other insect systems when you knock out their symbiotic bacteria. But unlike in those systems where they actually see that, you remember there's those two pathways of the tanning process. There's the sclerotization pathway and the melanization pathway. In those systems, what they saw is that the, when you knock out the bacteria, both pathways are impacted. So they saw that the cuticle of these insects became very pale in color. But what we see is that the impacts of the antibiotics or the bacterial community have no impact on that melanization pathway, suggesting that, that the bacterial contribution is not critical there. And in, in sort of closing, what we were able to demonstrate is that the bacteria within the um, guts of these ants contribute to the formation of the cuticle um, from the proteins, the linkers, and the chitin, but not the melanin. And this allowed us to understand the, mel the biosynthetic pathway where the, we have complementarity between the contributions of the host and the bacteria. So now I'm gonna shift gears a bit and talk about the other thing I'm very passionate about, which is broadening our research community um, for the best science. Um, and as Cindy mentioned, um, you know, I've been involved in, uh, I'm currently now the Senior Associate Dean for my College of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, and so this is something I've thought about for a long time, and now I'm in the position where I actually get to hopefully make meaningful change. Um, but I've also been involved in a lot of programming around bringing younger women into science um, and even young pro programming for younger women. So why is it that we see that the communities of, within science, technology, engineering, math do not reflect the general population of the United States? 
Well, one thing we know is that it's not due to a, a problem of ability or desire. We do know that there is a pay inequity um, for people who are not white men. We know that something called uh, imposter syndrome or the self-doubt can actually impact people's ability to thrive and excel. And I'll actually talk a little bit more about that in a minute, as well as the leaky pipeline. And, and that's a great analogy, but we'll actually talk through where it maybe falls down. And we will not fix these issues unless underrepresented groups stand up for equal opportunity, but it absolutely cannot stand there, stop there. Overrepresented groups must understand that this is an issue and actively work to support and um, uh, include benefits to underrepresented people and limit bias at all levels. So DEI or diversity and equity and inclusion is a term that's thrown around a lot, but I think it's important to take a moment and define each of these words. So diversity is the representation of all of our varied identities and differences, both collectively and as individuals. While equity ensures fair treatment, equality of opportunity, and fairness and access to information and resources for all, while inclusion builds a culture of belonging by actively inviting the contribution and participation of all people. And I like to point out that for many departments, institutions, um, you might have metrics where you're trying to achieve some level of diversity, but I want to point out that if you fix one, you don't fix all. So maybe just because you achieve your diversity goals, it does not mean that your work is done. You still have to actively create an environment that devalues those diverse perspectives and values all perspectives equally. One of the things we know that um, sort of undermines a lot of this is that we have this implicit bias or unconscious bias, and it refers to the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding actions and decisions in and, and, and an unconscious manner. We know that they're activated involuntarily and without your own awareness or intentional control, that they're robust and pervasive, and that everyone is susceptible to them, even people who believe themselves to be impartial or objective, such as judges or scientists. And they've even been documented in children. And if you think you're immune, actually Harvard has a really great online tool called implicit.harvard.edu. And you can take these online tests. A lot of them are around STEM disciplines themselves. And so I think highly encourage you um, to consider going on. There's a whole suite of them. It's really interesting to understand where your own biases are. And I really like this quote from Carolyn Finney when she was a speaker at Softness in 2020. She said that bias is not the same as prejudice and it's not the same as racism, but they're close cousins. And so I think we have to think about how do we limit our own biases? So coming back to this idea of the leaky pipeline as an analogy to explain sort of what we're seeing happen. In this case, we're looking at the percentage of women who are um, excelling and, and persevering within STEM. Um, <clears throat> and this can be done for any group. So since we know that women represent 50% of the US population, we should expect to see them maintained at 50% along this career trajectory of this pipeline. And what we see, this is an actually an older figure, but uh, I'll point out that now we actually see that more than 50% of undergraduates are women or, or identifying as women. I also wanna take a, point, a moment to point out that we actually don't have much data about the representation of non-binary individuals. Um, within STEM, we're starting to pay attention to that now, but we don't have enough data yet to, to make any meaningful conclusions. But what we see is that sort of every step along the way, we're losing women across STEM pipeline. Now, I want to point out that the reason that this analogy is so helpful is it's really in a quite um, easy to understand and you can understand and, and it's visually quite um, clear. But where I think it really falls down is that we act like these leaks are passive. We should probably think of them more as a strainer um, or a sieve, because what we actually know is that we're deciding who stays in and who's leaking out, and so that it's not a passive process. So why do we focus on the issue around women in science? One, I think it's because we've been thinking about it for a lot longer. Um, we've been measuring the data for a long time, um, and I would argue that it actually is an everyone issue. So one of the things we know is that unconscious and implicit bias can be um, uh, really pervasive. We know that it affects both men and women. Um, and what I mean by that is that both men and women can be biased against women, that women are more likely to be subjected to inappropriate sexual comments and advances. Um, and since we're actually losing women at every level in this idea of the leaky pipeline, we have to all do the work to retain them. 
I also like to uh, say that the women in science conversation is sort of the gateway conversation for having deeper and richer conversations around other axes of identity, which um, are being excluded from STEM. So one thing I'll share is that, you know, we know a lot about the data of women in STEM. And so if you look at this, what we see across all jobs, women and men are almost at equal representation within the um, employment. But when we look at STEM jobs in 2015, we can see that women are severely underrepresented. Now the National Science Foundation about every 10 years goes in and, and does a, a, a reassessment of this and it just came out about a week and a half ago. And what they showed is that since in 2021 that women make up 35% of the STEM workforce. So we are seeing an increase, but we're still far from equity. And if we look at the hourly earnings of um, people based on gender um, for STEM jobs and non-STEM jobs, what we can see is that having a job in STEM definitely pays better, but we're seeing a disparity across this. And for in this case in 2015, that women were making 84 cents uh, on the dollar for every one that a man is in making. Um, and we do have progress, but we still see that there's inequity across STEM jobs for women. Um, this is a study that was done uh, just a couple of years ago by the program officers of the National Science Foundation. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to assess whether their funding was biased in any way across um, from women and men. But before they could do that, they needed to understand the representation of women and men across the major fields that NSF funds and across career stage. And what you'll notice is that the men are represented by the blue circles and women are represented by the red triangles. Across the board, we see that, especially by the time we get to the full professor level, there are huge inequities of who's even participating in science and that this is persistent across all fields. And for some fields, even at the assistant level, we're already seeing huge inequities as to who's even participating. So it's not a women's only issue, just we have less data for other historically excluded groups, but I do have some that I'd like to share. So if we look across all STEM fields, so this is not just the academy, we can see that white men represent 55% of the entire workforce. So clearly they're overrepresented. But this is in 2006. And so you might say, well, you know, we've, we've been quite intentional about trying to minimize this gap. So what happens if we fast forward to 2015? We do see a slight decrease in the amount of uh, white men that are uh, represented and employed within STEM. And we see incremental changes for most other groups or no change at all. We also know that other axes of identity um, have huge impacts on who thrives and survives within science. And so this is some data on some first generation and low income students. And so each of the bar graphs, the first two are for first generation students. The first group is from the math and science and engineering. The second is for humanities and social sciences. And the colors of the bars tell us something about their financial need or their income status from needing full support all the way through needing no financial aid at all. And what we can see is that of course their socioeconomic status has a huge impact on their ability to thrive within um, undergraduate uh, uh, fields. But what I found most striking about this study is we often talk about making sure that we have resources for first generation students. But what this demonstrates is that even second generation students are still struggling in college, especially when they're socioeconomically disadvantaged. And so that we need to maybe carry out that programming a little bit further and not just for the first generation students. We know that for people with disabilities, they're far less likely to be employed across almost all fields and even within STEM. And that we, if we look at the representation of um, full-time professors from underrepresented groups, what we can see is that in all cases, we have almost no representation uh, as full-time professors. And even though we're seeing increases, that's so incremental that even at the best case scenario, we're looking at about 7%. Now, this is a more updated version of this, looking at both women, underrepresented minorities, and individuals with disabilities through time. And in all cases, we're seeing an increase. But again, even in our best case scenario for women, we're at about 38%. And for underrepresented um, identities and people with disabilities, we're still seeing a huge um, disparity in sort of who's participating within the academic doctoral workforce. We know that people with LGBTQIA plus identities are also um, often excluded from persisting within STEM. And this is a study that was done that looked at the retention of individuals with these identities um, within college STEM fields. And what they showed is that um, particularly uh, 
uh, LGBTQ identifying males were far more likely to leave STEM fields. Um, interestingly, they're not leaving college, they're just transferring out of STEM majors. So women in these male jobs are often viewed as less competent than their male peers. When they're clearly competent, they're often considered less likable. That women of color report they have had to confront negative racial stereotypes and that Black women were more likely than other women to report a bleak sense of isolation. That Latinx and Black women also reported for being mistaken as janitors or admins, and that men of color described similar experiences. That Asians reported stereotypes, for, and notably the forever foreign assumption, um, and oftentimes it's assumed that English isn't their first language, despite however many generations they've been in our country. And that women and people of color are often held to higher standards of personal appearance and dress. And so I just want to give you a couple of examples of sort of how we know these stereotypes persist. So this was a study that was published a few years ago where some science faculty decided to assess this. They took some CVs and just changed the first names from Jennifer to John, identical CVs, sent them out to science colleagues all around the US and just said, hey, look, I'm considering this person as a technician in my lab. They've just completed their undergrad. My institution requires some outside feedback. Would you just tell me whether you're likely to hire them? What would you pay them? Would you give them additional mentoring? And across the board, what they saw is that people were far more likely to hire John, despite the fact the resumes were the same than the Jennifer, and that this occurred across all of the axes, whether they would get hired, what they would be compensated, and whether they would get additional mentoring. And it held true for both women and male faculty. And the, um, the, uh, the business community has been looking at this for far longer than the science community. So this is a study where they've posted um, four different resumes up on popular job boards in major cities across the US, looked at the number of times they were clicked or whether they were contacted for job interviews. And not surprising, the, the, the resumes that had first names of Emily and Greg were far more likely to be contacted than Lakeisha and Jamal. So one of the things I've been hearing since, you know, I was early on in my career was like, just wait, time, we just need time, like, you know, this is a slow process. Um, you know, we've only started having these conversations more recently. But if we even look across, I would argue by 2006, we were already pretty engaged in these conversations. Um, by 2015, we certainly were. Um, and what we see is that even if we just look at gender disparity, at this rate, it's going to take about 90 years to reach that gender parity. So clearly the measures we've been doing are not aggressive enough. So why should we all work to solve this? Um, there's currently not enough trained um, candidates in STEM fields, and, and that means outside of academia. We know that when we have diverse teams, we see increased innovation, increased creativity and problem solving, increased um, teamwork, and they're far more likely to attract and retain talent. You don't have to just trust me. There's a lot of work out there that shows this. And in this case, what they did is they looked at the gender identity of authors across um, tens of thousands of publications and showed that when you had gender heterogeneous working groups, you produced higher quality science. The same hold true for ethnically diverse teams. And we know that when we put together diverse teams of problem solvers, they outperform already identified high ability problem solvers. And so if you're interested in more um, uh, examples of this, there's a great blog that highlights some of them. We also know that women um, uh, and underrepresented groups receive far fewer awards and that this is true across almost all fields and all career stages. The reason I've sort of put it in here is that I think that there's a lot of we can do here. We should all be nominating deserving women and underrepresented scientists for awards and not just diversity or mentoring awards. We should be you know, nominating them for the research awards as well. And this is important because there's data out there that already shows us that women in un, um, historically excluded groups are far less likely to self-nominate, and they're also less likely to ask others to nominate them. And right now what we see is that underrepresented faculty are playing a disproportionate role in advancing DEI, but everyone must work if we want to solve this. So I'd encourage everyone to sort of participate in these efforts at your institutions. So how do we actually solve these problems? First, we need policy changes that, are, that limit our effects of bias, and this has to happen at all levels. That individually, we have to acknowledge and, and uh, understand our own biases and actively work to reduce them. And that we have to impact the bias of others by actively supporting the individuals and maybe even participate in things like active bystander trainings. So what is an ally? An ally is someone from a non-marginalized group who uses their privilege to advocate for a marginalized group. You're essentially transferring the benefits of the privilege to those who lack it. 
And you can really only be an ally through action. So I like to say that it's a verb, not a noun. Well, on the other hand, we have performative allyship. And this is, again, when those same individuals from the non-marginalized group profess support and solidarity for a marginalized group in a way that either isn't helpful or that actively harms that group. And performative allyship usually involves that quote unquote ally receiving some kind of reward. Um, it's like a virtual pat on the back or a praise on social media. And so I really like these five tips from Francesca Ramsey on being an ally. First, you have to understand your privilege. And it doesn't mean that you're rich or you've had an easy life or that you've never had to work hard. There's just some things in your life you will never experience or have to think about because of who you are. You have to listen and do your homework. You should speak up and not over and you will make mistakes and apologize if you do. Remember, it's not about your intent, it's about your impact. And again, since an ally is a verb, saying you are an ally is not enough. You have to do the steps one through four over and over again. Um, so one of the things that I've done at Cornell University is I created a course to actually talk through some of these issues. Um, uh, I got to collaborate with an amazing team of graduate students and postdocs to put together this course and, and teach it a few times. Um, we've since written a paper um, specifically about how integrating a course like this into any discipline is possible. So if you're interested in potentially trying to address some of these issues or talk about them in your class, um, please feel free to take a look at our paper. And lastly, I would encourage everyone to join a, a diversity in science group. There's lots of them out there um, and many ways to sort of help uh, support diversifying STEM. So in closing, how do we solve these issues? Of course, we have to support policy changes that limit, reduce, or remove bias. We each need to be aware of our own biases and actively work to overcome them, especially before decision-making. We need to encourage and support underrepresented groups in STEM fields. And that mentors and role models are very important. So you should find one or serve as one. You should nominate historically excluded scientists for awards, ensure diversity in all admissions, hiring, or promotion committees, recognizing that we might be asking those same individuals to do more service than others. And so giving them credit for that. And we should all join and support women in science and diversity groups, regardless of your own identity. And I just wanna remind everyone that being an ally is an action, it's not an identity. So hopefully today I've been able to share a bit with you about the integrative approaches we use in my lab to study symbiosis. Specifically, I've shown you that ants and plants have evolved these um, increasing interdependence that symbiotic bacteria facilitated ants to be able to shift onto these herbivorous diets and expand up into the canopy. That these host associated bacteria contribute in meaningful ways to the host through the things like cuticle formation, and that each of us must actively work to create a just, equitable, and inclusive scientific community. So with that, I'd like to thank them, uh, my collaborators on the work, the members of my lab. I get to work with an outstanding group of scientists every day. Um, and uh, thank all of you for um, joining today. And if there's time, I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Chris. That's fascinating. And um, um, I actually have a question, but I'll um, encourage people to go ahead and unmute and ask questions, raise your hand, or put things in the chat. Um, your work is fascinating, and it's it's very, very high level. And I'm wondering what I forgot to mention at the start was I read about Corey in this great book um, by Edward O. Wilson called Letters to a Young Scientist. And um, uh, he talks about Corey's early work and how he was just fascinated at her drive and curiosity and made it a point to support and mentor her through her work. And so it's a wonderful story if you get a chance to, to read the book. But um, so given that, Corey, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you got interested in studying something so detailed and technical and now high level and what then, you know, what kept you interested um, in order to get to where you are now in your work and your career? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I grew up first generation low income and in uh, low income housing. So there wasn't a lot of nature around me, but there were always bugs. I'm from Louisiana, I'm from New Orleans. So, um, you know, there were always bugs around and I loved nature and I watched every nature program on PBS. Back then we didn't have Animal Planet and Discovery Channel and all that, but I was glued to any kind of time they had nature shows on TV. But I sort of thought like, that's all the scientists you need is the ones I was seeing on TV. And I didn't really know the options for becoming a scientist myself. Um, the only scientists I, well, anybody I knew with a science degree were my high school teachers. So I sort of thought, well, I'll go to college and study science and maybe I can be a high school teacher or work for a pest control company because I loved bugs. Ants were always my favorite. 
Um, but I was really fortunate when I got to college that I had a really amazing mentor who immediately pulled me into his lab and got me doing hands-on research. And that was when I was like, and the eyes were opened that, you know, how, I'm, how all the ways you could do science and all the opportunities out there and all the jobs, I just had no idea before that. And um, I really, I love evolution and I got really passionate about evolution and, and ants were always my favorite. So I found a way to merge them for my master's degree and then clearly came to Harvard for my PhD and was encouraged by E.O. Wilson and Nomi Pierce just to keep running with that. Um, and I think that sort of the, the way I got so involved in this, you know, I, if you would have told me I would study bacteria at the beginning of, you know, my career, I would have said, no way, they're not interesting at all to me. I work on things that are almost too small to see with your eye, which are ants, let alone bacteria. Um, so, uh, but then once you stuff them inside of an ant and they have some function, I find them incredibly fascinating. So I, I don't know if that really answers your question, but it, it just sort of explains my path and why I'm, I mean, I just think ants are the coolest thing in the world. And I've literally spent my entire career trying to learn everything I can about them. That's a, it's a great story. And I, yes, it does answer my question and I, and I get it. I sit on the porch and watch ants a lot, but um, <laughs> the other thing that I'll point out, you mentioned mentoring quite a bit. And I thought I saw something um, posted the other day that it was National Mentoring Day or Man Mentoring Week or Mentoring Month. I can't remember, but it's risen to a level of, of huge importance. And it sounds like that was really important for you, too. So thank you. Yeah, um, I just want to say, I see Nomi Pierce just put a, something in the chat. Hi, Nomi. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> um, and she was an amazing and continues to be an amazing mentor to me as well. Excellent. Anybody else feel free to unmute and ask. I have a question. Go right ahead, Caroline. Okay. Hello, thank you for your great talk. And I wanted to ask, uh, earlier in your talk, you said something to the effect of, now that I'm at this position, I can do something about DEI and STEM. And for those of us who are aspiring faculty members, like totally anticipating that someone like me, I'm likely to shoulder probably more of the department's efforts than say a white man. When it comes to interviews, what can I do maybe earlier to ask if the department is ready to support me in that process? Yeah, that's a great, a whole series of questions in there. Um, I want to <laughs> highlight that, you know, you can actually be engaged in DEI efforts now. When I said that I'm sort of now in a position, I actually have the ability to change policy, like structural capacities of the institution, which, you know, that's where I think we really make long-term meaningful change. But I've been involved in activities since I was a graduate student through postdoc and you know junior faculty, so I don't want you to think you have to wait. Um, but also, you know, keep in mind that you know your primary role is to do your research, right? And that this is an, an add-on. Um, and to that point, it, may, it does mean that people with marginalized identities are often the ones shouldering the, uh, the majority of the work. Um, it does also mean that you know you want to join a supportive environment. So asking questions around what the department's already engaging in, how they imagine supporting you, how they imagine leveraging you, um, are great questions to ask during a job interview. Certainly, I mean you won't, don't want to join a department that um, isn't going to value you. So certainly, I think that no one would think it's out of line to ask questions uh, early on in the interview stages. Thank you. Anybody else with questions for Corey? I will say that your um, uh, the portion of your talk on the diversity and inclusion, I found very interesting. We are doing some some studies um, looking at what uh, how to bring uh, minorities and underrepresented um, individuals, youth into STEM fields, get them interested, and as well as um, like I had mentioned at the very start before we started, um, how do we get young girls interested and keep them interested in order to pursue, you know, all the way through school and then pursue a STEM field? So um, this will be some good resources that we've gotten from you. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. I actually put together portions of this talk because I had some colleagues who just so uh, a lot of people, as scientists, we want to see data, right? And a lot of the work, um, early work, really came out of the social science fields, and that's usually through case studies. And so even though my colleagues and my male um, colleagues would hear this, they would say, oh, but I mean, a really 
you know, thorough case study would interview 60 people. And they're like, well, that's just 60 people's experience. And so I was like, there's data out there. So I started pulling it together because the scientists connect with data um, and really to help them understand at an individual level, what does the data really say so they can understand the issues better. Now, clearly this is something that works at an individual level, but if we wanna you know, implement institutional change, then it has to scale up, right? So that's not really what this talk was about, but it is something I think a lot about is how do we actually um, value the contributions, especially around DEI, um, give people credit for that work? How do we limit biases? How do we um, uh, do things like, uh, uh, measure impact. And so those are the things that I'm just embarking on now. So stay tuned and you can uh, ask me about it in a few years. <laughs> Sounds good. We might. Anybody else? Any questions? Go ahead, Mary. Yeah, I was just, as you were talking, I was thinking about one of our colleagues, former colleagues, uh, still a colleague, um, Zara Hazari, uh, who did a lot of the early research on science identity and 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 um, differences among historically marginalized groups. Um, but she's developed this program for the American Association of Physics Teachers called Project Step. And there's a couple of uh, lessons in there for physics teachers um, around looking at data, looking at data. And in particular around, uh, you know, why addressing addressing people's implicit bias that some of these percentage differences are just due to, um, you know, inherent or uh, anyway one of so one of the one of the um, pieces of data is around. Uh, female versus male physics, uh, physics students. And in Iran, many more females study physics. That, so, so it's about cultural differences, <laughs> that it's about a, a you know, cultural environment in which people are encouraged or discouraged and that those things can add up. But anyway, uh, your, your, your talk um, made me think of that. Um, uh, kind of interesting, uh, really explicit little lesson plan around uh, looking at our assumptions about why these differences happen in different fields. Yeah, it's really true. And those sort of cultural differences are huge and they, you know, play through our own implicit biases, right? And, and so that's why I encourage everyone to take those tests. But like, for example, where I grew up in New Orleans, the men do the majority of the cooking. So like for me growing up, I always thought of as men as the people who are in the kitchen. Um, and, you know, I realize now that that's really, you know, not how most of the U.S. works, but it's those little things that just get seeded into your con your subconscious that then can have big implications for how you think about the world around you. And so, you know, it's, it is really important to think about that, those differences. Anybody else? I want to be respectful of Corey's time. It's a little past eleven thirty. So, just a reminder: we will um, post the link to this talk on our YouTube channel, so you can watch it again. And I want to, uh, on behalf of the Science Education Department, everybody here, thank you, Corey, Dr. Corey Moreau, for a fascinating talk on your research, um, as well as your um, research into diversity and inclusion. Um, I find your ant research fascinating and I'm really getting into more of it. So um, again, thank you for your time and your talk today and um, hopefully we'll see you in the future. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Bye-bye.